Mm. Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann and uh, I'm the pastor of the Spring Church just over here on 221 near the hot spot uh, over there in Lawrence and uh, friends I come out here today out of a, uh, in, out of a care and a, and, a, and a desire for your soul to be saved uh, uh, a, a really a burdened spirit, a broken heart over the lost Dear friends, I believe the Bible. I believe God's Word. And God's Word says that those who are, who are outside of Christ are going to be punished under God's wrath. But I do also believe the parts in Scripture that say God has sent His Son into the world to save sinners. That Jesus Christ has come to redeem His people from the curse of sin. And friends, I come out here to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ so that those who are lost might have eternal life. I come out here to preach the gospel of grace, what the Bible describes as the good news of Jesus Christ. There is no other way of salvation. There is no other message that will save. It is only the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that can save you from your sins. It's the only thing that can redeem your sinful soul. And I am grateful to God that He has given me faith in this gospel and I have been saved by grace and so having been saved I desire you to be saved that you might not have to go to hell but that you'd go to heaven when you died that you would go and and be in God's presence for all eternity that your life even here on earth would be changed you would be given a new heart with new desires you would be as Jesus described in John chapter 3 you would be born again you would be born from above I come out here in full confidence of God's sovereign decree to bring His people to salvation. And so, I know that preaching is one of God's means to bring His elect to saving faith in His Son. And so I trust that if it is God's will, He will use this in the conversion of sinners. But even if not, even if this has no effect upon anyone, I do it to the glory of God. I do it out of gratitude to God and as an act of worship unto God. For the glory of God, everything is working to that glorious end, friends. The glory of God. God is working all things in this universe to the end that His name might be glorified. And so that's the reason I'm out here. It's to bring, the, bring God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise as the gospel of grace goes forth. And again, my name is Lucas Mann, and I am the pastor of the Spring Church. I would invite you, if you do have a question or a comment that you'd like to give, to please come and speak with me. I have uh, no problem speaking with you. I'd love to have a conversation with you about the things of God. In just a few minutes, a friend of mine will be here to stand alongside me, and he would, he would be pleased and honored to speak with you concerning these things as I continue to preach. But nonetheless, in Romans chapter 2 is where I would like to focus our attention this afternoon. In Romans chapter 2 verse 5 specifically is what I want to look at. That single verse there found and, and seated in this chapter. And it reads thus. It says in verse 5, Paul writes, Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And the subject that I would like to address, which flows directly out of this passage, is the hardness of heart that the religious have. The stubbornness and the unrepentant spirit that those who go and attend church have. And in the immediate context, that is not necessarily who Paul was dealing with, but he was dealing with the Jewish people in his day, who had said that they had the true God, they had the true God of glory, but they rejected His Son. And so, as we know from Scripture, if you don't have Christ, you don't have the Father, you don't have eternal salvation. And there's actually a direct parallel between the religious of this day and the religious of, the, of that day, and Paul's day. And it is this, they say they have God, but they do not. Many people who attend churches here in, in Lawrence County perhaps even are involved in churches, maybe even a deacon or a, or a pastor in a church, yet they are lost. 
yet they do not have eternal salvation. They claim to have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Perhaps you are one of those people, or perhaps you know one of those people. They're all around us, especially here in the Bible Belt. We find ourselves situated in a, in a very interesting spot in our nation, geographically speaking, where we are surrounded by religious speech. Churches on every corner. And it, practically everyone has had some sort of religious experience in one way or another. We have people claiming that they were saved because they were baptized. Or people because they walked an aisle and said a prayer. Or some evangelist told them that they were converted. Or perhaps they just simply had an emotional experience. And because of that and on the merits of that, they think themselves to be converted. Such people are self-deceived. They are lost. There are many who are in this state. There are many who claim to believe the truths of Scripture and claim to have the gospel of grace. Claim to truly believe it, have it as their own. Take ownership of it. There are many who claim to have the promises of God. There are many who claim to be a part of God's people, a part of God's covenant people, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they do not possess salvation. They do not possess eternal life. And so I know that there perhaps are many of you who are listening who are in that position, who fit into that category of persons who are religious yet lost, who claim to have the light of the gospel yet wander around in darkness. who claim to have lifeblood from God, yet are dried up, dead bones. And such people I greatly pity. And I trust that if in God's wisdom, He so chooses to use the gospel that is preached this afternoon to draw you to faith in His Son, then I will give Him glory. Either way, I will give Him praise and honor. But it is only the gospel of salvation that can save even the religious the religious need salvation. That is true. And really no one would contend that. Everybody seems to agree. There's very strong consensus amongst people of the earth that everyone is sin. No one is perfect. Everyone needs salvation. And those who are religious certainly need salvation as well. Both the pagan and the religious need eternal life. And it only comes through believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It only comes through grabbing hold of the promises of God as they're revealed in His Son. And so, my friends, that is what I seek to do this afternoon, is to preach the gospel of God's glorious grace, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will consider that this afternoon. And we will also consider the hardness of the religious heart of many religious people who are stubborn and unrepentant in their lost state. But before I do, I do want to consider just very briefly the context here in Romans chapter 2. Paul began in Romans chapter 1 by saying in verses 16 and 17 that the gospel was what he was going to write about in the book of Romans. He said in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That was what he set out to preach for the rest of, or I should say lay out and unfold the rest of the book, the rest of the book of Romans. But before he preaches the good news, he must preach the bad news. And that's why in those next few verses, in verses 18 and throughout the chapter, he preaches on God's wrath being revealed against the wicked, on God's judgment against the ungodly. But then he points the finger not toward the, the pagan, but toward the religious in chapter 2 of Romans. And in effect, he is saying simply, just because you're religious does not make you saved. It doesn't make you good. In fact, you're still in great need of a Savior. You're still in great need of salvation. And if you do not repent, as Jesus said, you will all likewise perish. And so that is where we find verse 5 here. is in the midst of Paul calling out the religious. 
and saying, you must be born again. It does not matter if you've never grown up in church. It does not matter if you have, um, or perhaps you have grown up in church. Either way, you must be born again. The command stands for all the children of men. You must be born again. And so as I said, let's look at verse 5 now that we know what surrounds verse 5. He says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Notice he says two things concerning their spirit, concerning their character. Two things. He says, firstly, that they are stubborn. They are stubborn. And this is a mark of people who are in churches today. They're stubborn. They will not listen to the preaching of the gospel. They will not give ear to the convicting word of the cross. Instead, they care more about committees and voting or social events at a church than they do about the glory of God and holiness and the gospel of grace. Even in Baptist churches we see this. People are deceived. People are deluded. They're stubborn. And then the second thing he says, he says they have an unrepentant heart. They possess a heart that's not contrite. And we know from the Psalms that that is an acceptable sacrifice in God's eyes. is a contrite and broken spirit. Someone who is humble. The Bible says God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. In James Those who are proud, God resists and God does not show them mercy. But for those who are humble and those who see their sin and who hate their sin and are disgusted by their sin and they flee it and they flee to Christ in their, in their depravity and in their poverty of spirit, knowing they're weak, those people have life eternal in the Son of God. And then he says this. He says, You are storing up wrath for yourself. Storing up wrath for yourself. What is the result of an unrepentant heart? And what is the result of a stubborn heart and a stubborn spirit that resists the preaching of the gospel? What is the result of the religious who turn a deaf ear to the convicting message of the cross of Jesus Christ? It is they are storing up wrath for themselves. They are storing up church people who do not truly follow after Christ are storing up wrath for themselves. Deacons and pastors who will who refuse to be born again and refuse to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ truly are storing up for themselves wrath on the day of judgment. And perhaps you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of judgment. Perhaps by your resisting of the message of the cross, resisting of the convicting message of the cross, you are storing up God's wrath for you on the day of judgment. And that is why it says you store up for yourself, you're storing up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Friends, God's judgment is coming upon this world and it's coming upon the wicked. Jesus said at the end of Revelation, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. And for those who are wicked, that's not an exciting thing. If you're outside of Christ, the coming of Jesus Christ is not a welcome thing because Jesus is coming to judge the wicked. We know out of Revelation 19, the Bible says that He comes and His eyes are a flame of fire and on His head are many diadems and it says He's wearing a robe dipped in blood. He's coming to punish the wicked. It even says that from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he might strike down the nations. And then it even says in Revelation 19, He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Friends, God's judgment is coming. Flee to Christ. Flee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't hang on to your sin. Your sin will damn your soul to hell, friends. Please, I care for you to warn you. I'm warning you of God's judgment. That's befall. It's going to befall the wicked. 
The righteous judgment of God is coming upon the wicked. Hey, John, John, John. Come here, brother. Here you go. A couple okay. signs. Okay, good. Exactly. Yeah, the, those are some, they're not that good, but they, they'll work. They'll work. Both double sided. Okay, okay gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here, brother. Mm. Mm. The judgment of God. God is a holy God. Do we realize that? Do people grasp it? You know, the religious people who say they, they go to church, they do the whole church game, they don't really know who God is. And you have to know who God is in order to understand the gospel. In order to understand the gospel of grace. You have to understand who God is and, and how He has come and saved, uh, come to save His people. How He has sent His Son into the world to redeem His elect. You have to understand who God is. Who is God? Well, we know from this verse in verse 5 here that God is a just God. He's a just judge. Uh, we know from the book of Genesis that God is the judge of all the earth. All the earth is under God's judgment. And that is a, a really a phrase that basically in effect means this. Every person without distinction is under God's judgment. And so that's one aspect of God's character. That's one aspect of who God is. Is God is a just judge. And the wicked do not comprehend this. Or at least may they they might, but on a very surface level, a very surfacey manner. It's not very deep. They don't really grasp this about God's character. But we must understand this when we understand the gospel of grace. Also in Ephesians chapter 1, listen to what Paul writes concerning God. In verse 3 he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's another thing about God. God is gracious. Out of the bounty of God's grace, does God give us gifts? Friends, we experience every day God's grace in one measure or another. I mean, the beautiful sun that rises and sets every day, the clouds in the sky, the birds of the air, the trees and the grass of the field, even the human body, its functions, the way it, it works so well. It's all speaking to God's graciousness, that God sustains His creation and even provides things for the wicked. He even provides food for the wicked and clothing for the wicked. Even the religious hypocrite, God provides for their needs. Which speaks to God's grace, that God shows kindness to those who do not deserve His kindness. Also, we know from the book of Leviticus that God is a holy God. And we know from the book of 1 John, God is love. It, 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 it's a mark of His character that God is perfect in love. He is the very definition of love. He possesses that intrinsically. But going back to God's holiness, the word holy means set apart. God is set apart from all that is perverse and wicked. And God is is. In the fullest extent, he's, he's, he's separate from us. From our fallenness and our filth. And he remains morally perfect. And so God in his infinite wisdom and in his holiness has put forth his law. Has given his command. He has given his law for the children of men to obey. Those commands that are given in Exodus chapter 20. Where God said... You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Those commands speak firstly to the character of God, who God is. See, as I said a minute ago, we need to understand who God is. In order to understand the gospel of grace, we have to understand the author of the gospel, and that is God Himself. The gospel is not something that came out of man's wisdom. It is the wisdom of, and power of God. And so these commands show us God's character. Why does God say you shall not murder? Because He's not a murderous God. You shall not steal because He's not a thief. You shall not lie. Why? Because God 
cannot lie, as the book of Hebrews tells us. And these laws also show us our character in light of the character of God. See, mankind can behold how filthy he is when he looks at God's holy law. The, the law of God was given to bring about the knowledge of our sin. See, we have to understand our sin before we can understand the Savior. We have to see that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We have sinned against God and we deserve His punishment for sin so that we can see the Savior. We can see the one who saves us from our sin. If Christ is a Savior from sin, we better understand what sin is. And sin, as the Bible says, is transgression of the law. It's breaking God's law. And so I ask you simply... Have you ever murdered? You say, no, I've never murdered anybody. Well, we go on and we look in Matthew 5 and we find there that Jesus says, in effect, that if you have anger in your heart toward your brother, you have, you have, you have in effect, committed murder. God sees it as murder and you deserve hell for your sin. So if you've ever done that in your heart or in your mind, God sees it, He's kept a record of it, and you deserve punishment for your sin. You have that guilt upon your account. You shall not commit adultery. Again, you say, I've been faithful to my spouse. Or I've been, I've been faithful to my boyfriend or my girlfriend. Well, friends, I want to ask you this. Have you ever looked with lust? Have you ever looked at someone with lust? Jesus said in Matthew 5, as I just took you there a moment ago, He said, if you look at someone with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Again, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. See, that's what the religious don't understand. They think that they can placate God or that they can try and have this thin veneer on the outside of, of goodness and religion and think by that they're going to be justified. They're going to save themselves through their outward performance, their outward conformity. But it is about the mind. It's about the heart. God is after a service in the heart. He's after people whose hearts are after Him. Him. And we know from Romans 3, there is no one who seeks for God. And that's our problem. That's our great predicament, is that we do not seek for God. We are, we are hostile to God. We are hostile toward God. And we are God-haters by default. And we deserve punishment for our sin. Another command, you shall not steal. Have you ever stolen? Well, then you're guilty of breaking the command and you deserve punishment for your sin. Your conscience ought to be troubling you by this point because of your law-breaking. Lastly, as in verse 16 of Exodus 20, it says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not lie. Lying is a, is a, is a heinous sin. It's a great evil in the eyes of God. Why? Because God in His character and in His perfection is not a liar. It says it's an impossibility for Him to lie. And so when we lie, we're offending God's character. It's an affront to who He is. It's an offense to Him. And so we, having broken these commands, we deserve a punishment. Just as someone here in Lawrence County, if, if someone goes down this street right here and they, they get stopped by a police officer because they were speeding, they have to take upon themselves the penalty. They have to pay the fine for breaking the law. And no one contends that. No one says, well, that's wrong that the police would stop that man. We all say that's good because if someone breaks the law, they have to receive the punishment. And so when it comes to God, He's infinite in perfection, infinite in justice, and so God requires of the wicked punishment. He requires punishment in His perfection and in His holiness and in His justice. Think about if God was not just, then you could not trust Him. He would be arbitrary in His judgments and unpredictable. It'd be scary to have a God like that, but Scripture de uh, declares from cover to cover that God is a just God. And so... That is also a cause of fear, though. Because we find ourselves having broken God's law, the eternal standard of God's justice and God's judgment, and we have fallen short of it. We have trampled it underfoot. And what do we deserve? What's the punishment for sin? Well, I know of no better place to go. I know of no other greater witness to call to the sand than the man himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of glory. In fact, this may pluck your interest, but Jesus spoke more on hell than He did about heaven in His preaching ministry. Why was that? Because He wanted to warn the wicked 
of the impending judgment of God against their sin. Listen to what it says in, in Mark chapter 8, or excuse me, Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Listen to the way Jesus describes hell. He says in verse 43, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Friends, hell is not a place that you want to go to. And I certainly don't want you to go there. I come out here and stand on this sidewalk because I care for you. I don't want you to perish in your sins. Listen to what Jesus said concerning hell in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. He is speaking... In, in this chapter about what he is going to say to the wicked on the day of judgment of the day of judgment he says in verse 41 depart from me accursed ones into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels verse 46 he says this of the wicked they will go away into eternal punishment hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth it's a place where god's judgment is upon the wicked and god's wrath is revealed against those who've broken his law Hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's the place of outer darkness, the unquenchable fire. And friends, I do not want you to go there. Don't die in your sins. Don't lose your soul for your sins. But flee to the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But nonetheless, we find ourselves in this state of having broken God's law and we know the punishment we deserve. We deserve hell. And so we find ourselves... Sinners in the hands of an angry God just waiting and the time is just ticking away as we're waiting the final day of God's judgment upon the wicked. As we're just simply waiting for that day when we will die and stand before our Creator and receive the due penalty for our sin. And truly there is no hope. Even for the religious there is no hope. You can't do enough good deeds to justify you before God. You can't placate God. You can't bribe God. Imagine a convicted rapist and a murderer trying to bribe a judge. Saying, Judge, don't worry, I'll give you some money. Let me off the hook. If the judge is just, he is going to laugh. And he's going to ride that guy off. In fact, he might even get punished for having tried to, uh, tried to bribe the judge. In fact, the judge would be offended that the man thought so little of his character that he would ask him that. And friends, it's the same way with God. It's an offense to God to try and make oneself righteous with God by your own performance. It's an offense to God for the religious to try and work their way up to God as if they can do it. As if they can do it by their own works. Romans 3.28 reads, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Why is that? Because verse 20, For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. God's law was never meant as a way of salvation. It was never meant to show us how to be saved. It was meant to show us that we need a Savior. And so we find ourselves condemned to hell without any hope. And that is where the Savior comes in. That's where the Lord Jesus Christ comes in. That God, being rich in mercy and being great in His love toward His people, God's love is greater than anyone, anyone can possibly comprehend. It is such a great, great, mighty love God has for His church. And He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come into this world. And as John 3.17 tells us, He did not come to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He didn't come to judge the wicked. He's coming in His second advent to do that. But in His first coming, He came to save the wicked. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ's purpose in coming was to save the wicked from their sin. And so Jesus came and lived a perfect life of total submission to the will of the Father. He obeyed the law of God perfectly in His perfect life, and never transgressed a single command that the Father gave Him. 
Jesus Himself said in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill God's law, to live in obedience to those commands that we broke. So when the command reads, you shall not lie and we lie. You shall not steal and we steal. Or you shall honor your father and mother and we do not honor our father and mother. We look to Christ and what do we see? He completely obeyed the commands. He never lied. He never stole anything. And He obeyed His parents. He, he respected and honored His parents perfectly. And so that speaks to the glory of Christ. His absolute wonder and majestic power that He can do that. He can fulfill the law like that. Single-handedly. Something none of us could do no matter how hard we tried. And then, in His submission to the will of the Father and in obedience to the foreordained plan of God, the predestined plan of God, the, the Lord Jesus Christ humbled Himself and laid Himself down and suffered a horrible bloody death on a Roman cross. He was beat and whipped and spat upon and He was nailed there on that cross some 2,000 years ago outside of Jerusalem there. And He was even abandoned by His disciples. Even, even they, they were afraid and so they left. And so here we find this, this glorious Son of God, the, the Son of God, hanging upon the cross and on that cross something happened. Something happened at that cross that the physical eye did not see. And it was this, the Father unleashed His wrath upon His Son. The Father punished Him whom He loved. God the Father treated Him as if He was guilty, though He was innocent. The Father treated Christ as if He would committed the sin that I have committed and that all of His people have ever committed. The whole lot of us, all of our guilt was thrown on Christ and He took ownership of it. And the Father unleashed His judgment upon His Son. Just as we read here in Romans chapter 2 as we saw that the wicked on the day of judgment will receive God's wrath. So what is the cross of Jesus Christ? It is the Father unleashing His wrath upon His Son. Isaiah 53.10 says, But Yahweh was pleased to crush Him. Jesus said in Mark 15, he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His sufferings on that cross were so, uh, so weighty upon his shoulders, he cried out in agony as he's bearing the wrath of God. Hell is an infinite uh, judgment upon the wicked. It's God unleashing his infinite wrath. And so what is the cross? It is God unleashing his infinite wrath on his son. That's the love of God manifest. That's the demonstration of God's love. Uh, Romans 5 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for for His people. For His church. Ephesians 5.25 tells us that Jesus loved His church. And so He died there at that cross. He cried out to tell us die. That is, it is finished. And on that cross, the wrath of God was spent it was gone. He propitiated it to use biblical language. That is, He satisfied the wrath of the Father. And after three days in that tomb, the Father exalted Him into heaven and received Him into celestial glory after 40 days. After three days in that tomb, the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the grave. The Father rose Him up by His own power, His own intrinsic power, Christ rose from the grave. And He is alive today. Forevermore, Christ is alive. And as the book of Hebrews says, He will never die again. Death has no power over Him. It is done. It is finished. The sins of God's people are paid for in full. 
And so, as I said, after 40 days of further ministry, Christ then, uh, 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 He ascended into heaven. He ascended bodily into heaven, into glory. And the Bible says, He sat down at the right hand of the Father in glory. And He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. He is there interceding on behalf of His people. And friends, you need an intercessor. You need someone to stand before you and God. And no man can do it. No priest can do it. No pastor can do it. No church can do it. You have to have someone who has who is fully God and fully man. You've got to have the God-man, and that's Jesus Christ. You've got to have the divine Son of God who will argue His own righteousness on your behalf, who will argue His substitution on your behalf, and He will not argue your righteousness because you don't have any to argue. And Christ Jesus is a perfect advocate. He has never lost a case. The Bible tells us that Satan accuses the brethren before God. Satan accuses Christians before God. But the Bible also says that Jesus Christ is our parakletos. He is the one who has been called alongside to help us. And He intercedes for us. And so the proper reaction to the gospel of grace for both the religious and the pagan, for both, both the unchurched and the church, is this. Is to flee to Christ. To flee to the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe upon Him. Jesus said, Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Friends, Jesus said in Mark 1.15, Repent and believe the Gospel. Turn from your sin. That's what repentance in its essence is. To change your mind. To flee your sin. To flee your rebellion. To flee your selfishness and your drunkenness, your idolatry, your pornography. To flee all of those things, even flee your self-religiousness, your, your self-pride, your self-righteousness, trying to justify yourself by your own works. And you fall upon Christ. You come to Christ in humble submission and you believe upon Christ. You grab hold of the promises of God as they are revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ in His coming. As Romans chapter 4, verse 3 says, what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He simply believed the promises of God and he was saved. He was saved by the grace of God Almighty. And God forgave Abraham of all his sin because Christ was coming to pay for his sin. And friends, you can have forgiveness of sin if you repent and believe upon Christ. He received total remission of sins. And then the Father credited to Abraham Abraham's account the righteousness of Christ. He was given righteousness as a gift of grace. Those who believe upon Christ are given a gift of righteousness. That is namely the perfect righteousness of Christ. And so when the Father looks upon them, He sees Christ. And when He looked at Christ on that cross 2,000 years ago, what did He see? He saw them. That's the exchange of the Gospel, friends. Christ takes upon Himself my sin and my filth and my iniquity. And I am in turn receive His righteousness as a gift of grace. I receive it as a free gift from God. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The economy of salvation is so ordered that it is all by grace. It is all by the sovereign grace of God, so that God receives the glory. God gets the praise. God gets the honor. And God gets the exaltation. See, friends, salvation is all to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. It is all for Him. It is all for Him. All to the glory of God. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the great things that He has done that so loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Friends, flee to Christ. Flee to the Lord Jesus Christ for His glory. It's all for His glory. It's all for His honor. It's all for His praise, friends. Amen, God bless you, sir. God bless you. Here you go, here you go.
Sorry, this is our church card, and then I'll give you a gospel. Oh, he's got a gospel yeah, track. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm about to start hitting the streets myself. Really? Yeah, really? they talked to Lawrence County, Lawrence City. They said I was go for them. Waiting on Clinton. Hmm. But um, I'm a street Dog. pastor myself. What's your name? Kale Pipe Where do you pastor? Well, I I help out at... Uh, I'm going to continue to preach. I'd love for you guys to talk. <laughs> God bless you. Hmm. Mm. It's all for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory indeed. And now, friends, I, I, I plead with you. Flee to Christ. Come to Him today. Don't, don't concern yourself with the cares of this life and this world. You who are young, you who are old, you who are black, you who are white, flee to Christ. He is the Savior for all men. All different kinds of people. Christ is welcome. Christ is welcoming. He, he is the Savior of the world. He takes away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Flee to Christ, you unreligious people. You have no association with church. You flee to Christ and be saved from your sin. And you religious hypocrites, turn to Christ and be saved. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even you who are in church every week, you need to be saved from your sins. You need to be born from above. Run to Christ. Follow Christ. Obey Christ. The Bible tells us, Jesus says in the Gospels, He says, if any man is to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. Take up your cross and come after Christ. Take up your cross and come after Christ. It will cost you everything, but it is worth it. Christ is worth your obedience and your submission. He is the King of glory. And even if there are Christians here today, I want to encourage you. Preach this gospel to the lost. Share it. Evangelize your family and your friends and feed on this. It is our daily bread. It is a manna from heaven that God provides for us. Our sustenance from day to day. So please, my dear brethren, please, Live on the gospel and share the gospel with the lost. As, as we saw here in closing in Acts chapter 2, in verse 5, we saw in this verse that many religious people are stubborn of heart and are unrepentant. And by that, they are storing up for themselves God's judgment and God's wrath against them and against their sin. But we have seen in this sermon that Jesus Christ saves from sin. That Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of God's elect. And so it is to Him I say, We ought to bring glory. We ought to bring praise and we ought to bring honor. All things are working to the end that Christ would be glorified. And so give Him glory, my friends. Indeed, He is worthy of glory and He is worthy of praise. I'll end off with what Paul wrote in this very book, in the book of Romans, chapter 11. He said this in verse 34. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, to God be the glory in all things forever. Amen and amen.